Welcome to the Live Inspired Podcast with John O'Leary. John is the number one national best-selling author of the book On Fire. He's a world-class inspirational speaker, and he's the host of the Live Inspired Podcast. John interviews extraordinary individuals on their life story so that you can wake up from accidental living and more fully live your life story. Here's your host, John O'Leary. Well, hello, my friends. This is John O'Leary, and I am so happy to have you here joining me in the Live Inspired Movement. On every Live Inspired podcast episode, I have amazing guests join me to share their story, their successes, their failures, their lessons, their life. You're going to hear profound and unforgettably inspiring stories, but more importantly, here it comes, you're going to have some real ideas to apply, to put into play, and to transform your own life. Before we dive into today's program, and by the way, it's historically important today. It's going to be amazing. Hang on for it. Before we talk about it, though, I want to invite you, if you haven't yet, to stay in touch with us online. We have a great community over at JohnO'LearyInspires.com. It's where we keep all of our social links to Facebook and LinkedIn and Twitter and all the others. It's where we keep all of our videos, our blogs, information on speaking and writing, traveling, life, and past podcasts. You'll want to check it out. It's all there for you. JohnO'LearyInspires.com. 30 years ago, a little boy named John O'Leary, same guy, found himself after being gone for 14 months from school, being brought back to grade school. It was a very scary time. I'd been burned as a nine-year-old kid, was in the hospital for five months or so, spent a couple additional months rehabbing, recuperating, slowly getting better. And then a little boy gets pushed back into the classroom. And I remember that day in the station wagon being terrified of how people might respond to me. You you see, I I left on a January uh, athletic and upright and, uh, you know, just normal, like everybody else. And then I come back 14 months later or so in a wheelchair, scarred, without fingers. And yet my classmates, instead of turning their backs on me or making fun of me, these little kids lined the street, I'll never forget it, with posters. My mom pulled in with this wooden station wagon and classmates from my fifth grade class, but also from the fourth grade, third grade, second grade, all the way down to K, all the way up to eighth grade. The big eighth graders, man, 14-year-old beasts, boys and girls, were lined up welcoming this little boy back into the community. It changed my life that day. I I realized that I may have been burned, but my life wasn't over. I I could move on. I I could be accepted and embraced. I want you to contrast that with how the story from this episode today with our guest Carlotta Lanier unfolds. She grew up in Little Rock, Arkansas in the mid-40s, in the late 40s, and in the early 40s. Brown versus the Board of Education is going to be a case that touches her life because she is going to be one of the very first to come back into school as one of what's called the Little Rock Nine. She's going to be one of the very first. She goes back to Central High School in Little Rock, Arkansas, through mobs, through protests. She's not wanted. The National Guard won't protect her. Troops are sent from the 101st uh, out of Washington, D.C. to protect this little girl, age 14, as she is brought day after day through the mobs, through the protests, through the name calling, through the hatred, into school. And yet she goes on to not only endure school, to be embraced by some of her classmates, but to embrace life. During the protests and the marches and the the challenges that we face as a community with the name calling and the yelling and the divicity that we still have, I thought, I thought what better time is there than now to bring on a champion of freedom? She is heroic. She is celebrated. She is here to share her story. My friends, grab your journals, grab your hearts, open both up as we bring in our most recent friend, her name, Carlotta Lanier. Carlotta Lanier, welcome to Live Inspired with John O'Leary. Thank you. Carla, it is an honor to have you on our show and uh, historically relevant, incredibly accomplished lady. Take us back to not what you're doing today, but uh, Mm -hmm. take us back to your childhood. Where did you grow up? I grew up in Little Rock, Arkansas. I was born and raised there. Okay, and and what are your memories of Little Rock, Arkansas as a little girl? 
Well, um, enjoying playing in the summertime, enjoying school year round uh, from September through May. Um, enjoyed um, listening to the older people talk about certain things, and uh, you know, I grew up during the days when um, you, um, you 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 spoke when spoken to. Mm-hmm. Or you speak. Yes. <laughs> so, it, you know, it was not something that I was involved in conversation with older people, but I really did like listening to the, the stories of my great uncles and aunts and uncles and aunts. Was, was there one individual as a little girl that you were really dramatically and positively influenced by? Uh, one in particular, no. There, there were just many uh, extended family members that... Um, I enjoyed being around, and uh, for various reasons, they were all, you know, re- relatively different in in what they brought to the table. So um, I just just soaked it all up. That's all. You realize that one of the reasons why we are so familiar with your name and your story is because you are part of an event and a group that that changed society. T- t- talk to me a little bit about uh, about. Uh, what happened in Arkansas as a 15-year-old girl as you're going well, back to school? Actually, it was as a 14-year-old. I, that, that's the only um, uh, difference that I have with the others. I'm the youngest of the group, and, and it's always kind of funny when we get together um, because they pretty much control everything. <laughs> <laughs> they <laughs> so still do, huh? I, I just listen, right? I, uh, I was... Uh, 14 years of age in the ninth grade and in the spring of 57. And um, I had the opportunity to sign a sheet of paper um, that uh, my homeroom teacher uh, sent around. He came in with a a bulletin and halfway down um, reading the bulletin to the the class, he said, any of you who lived Mm. within certain uh, street boundaries and have any intentions of going to Central high school in the fall, please sign this sheet of paper. And he put it on the first desk. Yes. And it just went around the room. And when it got to me, I immediately signed it and gave it to the person behind me. Did you know what you were really signing? Yes. I mean, you understood the significance of this event? Oh, I did, because um, I had been waiting since 1954 to to, to go to a a school in my neighborhood uh, that was closer. And uh, I knew what Brown v. Board, uh, we discussed that in, in my classroom. We discussed it at home. We discussed it in church and the YWCA. I mean, we, I, I knew what that meant. And um, I thought, sure, that we would be going to a neighborhood, my, my neighborhood school, um, the fall of 1954. But then when the um, school board had said that they would abide by the decision of the Supreme Court, yes. but they would have to put a plan in place. And so that plan turned out to be building two new high schools, one on the east side of town, hmm. which was predominantly black, and one on the west side of town, which was predominantly um, yes. middle class and, and upper, so uh, economically. I did live west, but not as far west as that school was being built. So I pass Little Rock Central High School every day going to my black junior, senior high school. And um, I I knew what was in that school. And uh, it it, it was just a a situation for me is that I look to go to Little Rock Central High. And I had a right to be there because the Supreme Court had given me that right. And the laws were in place. And I had grown up knowing that if you stay within the law, yes. you you stood a better chance. Let me put it that way. Not that it, it all worked to your advantage. But anyway. Uh, on September 4th, 1957, I, b- I believe you make the first attempt to make your way into this new school. Yes. T- talk about that. Uh, September 4th um, was actually, um, uh, one. the first day was really September 3rd, where uh, we were asked not to come that day. But on that is when the governor came on, on um, 
the television that evening and said that he was um, bringing out the Arkansas National Guard mm. to protect the citizens of Little Rock. Well, I surely considered myself a citizen. My fa- father played paid taxes just like everyone else. And anyway, um, on September 4th, my mother dropped me off at the at the location that had been described a block away from the school. And I met with the other uh, students who were going, and then there were some ministers, Mm -hmm. Little Rock Ministerial Alliance, um, uh, a group of ministers there. One was my um, uh, minister, along with um, uh, a couple of white ministers and a couple of uh, Negro, as we were called at that time, Mm -hmm. uh, ministers. So we had a, a, a... prayer, and then we walked that block, hmm. and we went up to, uh, we got to the block um, as to where we were going to walk through the, up the sidewalk, and each time we got closer, the uh, Arkansas National Guard closed ranks, so they mm-hmm. just got tighter and tighter. So finally, the um, hmm. uh, commanding officer uh, came up and, and spoke to the white minister and said, um, you you know, you need to turn around and take these kids back home. And that is when I think Ernest Green said, y- you're not going to let us in? And I couldn't believe that, yes. because I, I just knew that we had a right to go to the, to the school. We had signed up to go, even though the 39 that I thought was going to be there, it turned out to just be mm-hmm. our little small group. Yes. So uh, we had to turn around, and we walked away. Now, in the meantime, across the street, there was a lot of uh, gathering of of name, you know, people calling us names and all that sort of stuff. But I, I really was not afraid because the guards were there, and I truly did think that they were there to uh, protect the citizens of Little Rock. So I just felt if there was anything going to go wrong, these guys that are lined up here will take care of that and they're the ones that turn you around i understand that right. the, the the mob mentality grew from over the time yeah. over a period of you're right from from that time on um september 23rd was our next yes um day to go um that we attempted to go in fact we did go we got in uh the mob was uh, much larger now and um uh, we got in through a side door, and I did not see all that took place uh, mm. from that time until we were spirited out of the school because my classroom was on the back end of the... It was not on the street side. But uh, the policeman knocked on my... Uh, I was in my geometry class and um, my third class that day, and I guess by that time, they realized that the 17 policemen that were out there to um, maintain uh, a decorum with the group of mobsters or the, yes. uh, across the street, they couldn't handle it. And so they thought it was best to uh, take us out of the school. So all of us gathered at the office, uh, the um, main office, and then the policemen uh, directed us into the bowels of the school, and we got into uh, police cars, and we were told to put blankets over our heads and mm. and don't look up. C- Carlotta, yeah. you're, you're a 14-year-old baby. Right. Um, and the 14-year-old did come out from underneath the, <laughs> the, the blanket to see what was going on because my heart was racing by this time because I overheard the policeman tell the driver Put your foot to the floor and don't stop for anything. So it was very serious. Yes. And I recognize that. Um, and if anyone had been crossing that sidewalk as we yes. shot out of that school and off the grounds and made this right hand turn, I, they would have been instantly killed. It is no question about that. When did you come back? September 24th. Um, or September 25th. So you just, you just kept coming back? Yes. Day after day. When, when did the it third day. start slowing well, down, at least publicly, outside of the schoolhouse? What's that? I'm sorry. It's okay. When did it start slowing down, that mob mentality? That, oh, that... it never did. Not that year. 
uh, the mob mentality was was somewhat broken up once President Eisenhower sent in the 101st yes. Airborne, <laughs> which was the um, um, September that evening of the 24th. So the 25th is when we went to school with a uh, in in a military station wagon with a jeep in front and a jeep in back and and fixed bayonets and of uh, the military and they marched us. Um, you know, they surrounded us and um, marched us into the school. I have today issued an executive order directing the use of troops under federal authority to aid in the execution of federal law at Little Rock, Arkansas. This became necessary when my proclamation of yesterday was not observed and the obstruction of justice still continues. It is important that the reasons for my action be understood by all our citizens. As you know, the Supreme Court of the United States has decided that separate public educational facilities for the races are inherently unequal and therefore compulsory school segregation laws are unconstitutional. So from then on, we had a, a guard that went from one classroom to the next with us um, during that school year. So, I mean, just envision 1,200 I can't. troopers bivouacked on your school grounds and a helicopter buzzing over you, your school. I mean, that's and, 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 and military up and down the hallway with, you know, with, with guns. Now, I did find out about 10 years ago at the 50th anniversary, there was some um, 101st Airborne, uh, those, you know, some, mm-hmm. they, they had come for the 50th. And uh, one told us, he said, you know, we didn't have bullets in those guns. <laughs> and, you know, I think about that, and I think that was very wise, to be mm-hmm. honest with you, because, um, you know, deaths really could have taken place. Um, if if they couldn't handle it with the butt of a, of yes. a rifle or what have you, um, then the next thing would have been shooting yes. one. So, um, you know, I, I, 50 years had gone by, and I thought all along that those guns were loaded. Carlotta, children generally are colorblind. Right. But children of racists aren't. Once you make it through the National Guard and once you make it into the schoolhouse, you're still surrounded by kids who all look different than you. And uh, there's a scene outside of the schoolhouse. There's helicopters overhead. There's stuff going on internally. What, what was it like dealing even with these kids in the, in the schoolhouse? Well, you know, I really do think that if uh, there, there was a silent majority there that I think would have accepted us had not been for um, the political agenda of the governor and the White Citizens Council and the all the subversive groups that were out there um, against us uh, going to school there. Um, a lot of the kids would look away. But yes. then there was a, a, a group that made it their business to yes. make it miserable for us every day. And uh, they walked on the back of my heels until they bled. Mm. Um, you know, if you dropped your books, you learn how to put your rear to the... Yes. Walls so that they wouldn't, once you got kicked in the rear, from picking up your books, you, you realize um, what you needed to do. So I, I had to learn a lot of defensive mechanisms that, that, you know, on my own. Even though I had a guard that was walking beside me, kids will be kids, and they will find a way to um, do what, you know, some yes. of their parents were no doubt. E- edging, it, uh, you know, them on to do. And they knew that they had uh, permission because of, of, of how they grew up. Carla, so, outside of the guard and the eight others that you're with, were there some, you, you call them the silent majority, right. were there some vocal majority that stood up and, and did yeah, what that, we consider today were, the right that, thing? Yeah, there were some. Uh, I, I will admit to that, um, that uh, and, and they receive the same type of uh, uh, response uh, yeah. as we were getting. They were being called names, and um, 
Some were chased home at the end of the day, I was told. I, I, I didn't know any of this until later, but uh, some of the incidents that had happened to them that I got to, when I had the opportunity to have conversations with some that um, were there at the same time. I mean, it was 40 years later before I even had any um, yeah. exchange of communication with anyone. Of the Little Rock Nine, how many graduated? Uh, well, we all graduated, but not from Central. Okay. Uh, uh, Ernest Green was the first. He was the cent- uh, that year, the in 1959, the... I mean, 58, the 57, 58. He was the only senior in the group, and he graduated. And then the schools were closed the next year. And then Jefferson Thomas and I went back as seniors in the year 59, 60. So it was really three of us who participated in graduation exercise. The others received their high school diplomas from other places that they eventually went to, such as out in California, Mm -hmm. in Kansas City. Um, I do think that two of the nine that had, when the schools were closed, they were being seniors and they wanted to graduate. So they took correspondence courses like I did and um, and did some some type of, of extra work in other school systems in other states to get the credits they needed, and I think their diplomas were mailed to them. Carlotta, you're 14 under a blanket, uh, peeking out at a a scene that I can't even imagine today. Mm. You're walking around from class to class being kicked and called words that I can't imagine today. Why did you go back? And then why'd you go back again? And then why'd you go back again? Well, you know, I, I, I had a right to be there, and the more they wanted to keep me out, the more I was determined to complete my mission, which was to go to school, go to school, get the best education available, and 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 graduate, and and be able to apply to um, schools um, other than where I knew I could go, as far as higher education was concerned. So I wanted the same opportunities as the next person. Uh, I was no different, other than skin color. I I worked hard. To, to do well in school, even before I went to Central. So I had always been taught from cradle on that, that uh, education was the road to, to success. You, you needed to have all the education possible. So I, I just knew I was doing the right thing, and I had, had a right to be there. Did you view yourself as a heroic trailblazer? None whatsoever. Do you today? Well, I accept it today. <laughs> <laughs> I, I I did not I did not go there to be some, you know, icon, a heroic person. Have have there been gatherings not only of just the nine, which I would imagine the answer is yes, but have there been gatherings from the entire school where you, you came back together to talk about what it was like? Well, I'm sure they had not really. Um, only it only happens at these anniversary type situations. Now, to be on, to, to to give you another um, piece of this, I was invited to my fiftieth class reunion, and I was determined to go to that. Yes, which was um, uh, it, it, I graduated in 1960, so it was 2010, and. Um, you know, there were people who um, were very cordial, yes. and 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 then there were those that stood off. So it was, pretty, yeah, you know, they they were still in that mindset. So and and um, you know that 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 was fine. I mean, uh, I was determined to to go to the fiftieth class reunion. As I said before. I I think they've been having class reunions before the 50th, but that's okay. (laughs) (laughs) You know, I I fit in. I look a lot like other folks from my own high school, but you may not Mm -hmm. know this. When I was nine years old, I was burned terribly because of that. I have Mm. scars on almost 90% of my body and, and no fingers on my hands. For the most part, I was welcomed into the classroom, but there was one guy that I still remember vividly that I still think about frequently. It's been Mm -hmm. 40 years almost. Mm -hmm. Uh, That would just rip on me and crush my spirit. Mm -hmm. You had hundreds, and then you had thousands outside of the school building. I'm Mm -hmm. I'm curious, 
are there images or names that you still remember today, like faces of, of that bully, of that well, brutality that, that yeah, you just can't there, let go of? there are faces that I remember. I, you know, I got to the point where that after that first two or three weeks, I didn't turn any names in to the principal or to the vice principal because they, they, I didn't see them doing anything to mm. curtail uh, this harassment and bullying that we were receiving. So I just put my focus on doing well in my classrooms. So I remember some faces. The redhead <laughs> was the one who always walked on the back of my heels. Mm. And I decided that if she was going to do this, she was going to have to work for it. So <laughs> I walked very, very fast, as fast as I could from one classroom to the next. Mm-hmm. And if necessary, sometimes I would stop dead, stop in my tracks, and she'd run in the back of me and then... I'd hear some, you know, nasty words out of her. So, uh, yeah, I, I remember certain faces, but names, um, I really can't give you that. Um, there were a few that I knew that were, that were nice to me. I, I do remember those names. There was a president of, of the student body. Um, it, all of this was new to him yes. as well. And I guess he did the best he could under the circumstances and the direction that he was receiving from uh, the the teacher uh, uh, sponsor. Yes. So, um, you know, or the principal or what have you. So, you know, those sort of things you, know, you, you do remember. And uh, but, um, uh, like I said, it was new to everyone, uh, and 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 as to how to handle it. I think that if the the adults had not gotten involved, I do think that those children that would have been receptive of us or ex- to accept us mm. in the school, I think that they would have been able to control things a little bit better. Uh, have you forgiven the, the redhead and the, the, oh, the, yeah. the mom mentality? I, yeah. Oh, yeah. I, you know what? My family, my parents never taught me to hate. Uh, I just consider them some very ignorant people, <laughs> and I will go to my grave feeling that way. Um, if they can sleep at night, well, so, you know, more power to them. <laughs> uh, but I'm not going to waste my energy and time on ignorance, and that's what I considered it. You don't waste time, from what I understand. Even today, you are extremely active still in the community. Yes. Tell us what you're doing today. Well, I have been involved in many things. I have been on the board of uh, trustees at a couple of uh, higher education um, schools, University of Northern Colorado being one, and I love School of Theology another. I've been on the board of Colorado AIDS Project. I'm involved in a national organization of women called the, the Lynx Incorporated. Uh, I, I do... Uh, I, 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 go and, and help out in elementary schools. I do a lot of speaking engagements uh, at universities and so forth. I just left University of Nebraska last week. I'm going to University of Central Oklahoma uh, next week. Um, I'll be in Des Moines Hour speaking to a um, organization uh, banquet. Mm. So I do a lot of that, and I have written a book called mm. A Mighty Long Way, my journey to justice at Little Rock Central High School. And because of that book, I get a lot of speaking engagements to come and, and speak to groups. I just uh, was up in uh, the mountains, the Rocky Mountains of Colorado, um, speaking to uh, 300 uh, young people on diversity and inclusion um, To um, that they are starting. Um, uh, their high schools are trying to... Um, uh, encourage uh, people to be more open yes. and, and, and engaging of people who, are not, who don't look like them. So um, I was asked to give the keynote to that, and I did. So I do a lot of things on that nature uh, uh, regarding that. I have two grandkids, and I, I really do need to start spending a little bit more time with them. <laughs> <laughs> when you look out at where we are as a civilization, as a society— through your unique perspective, I mean, the, the, there's no one in the world that has a, a perspective like yours. How do you feel about the way things are today? I mean, are, are you optimistic? Are you d- downtrodden? What, what, what do you feel? Well, I'm as you not look around? downtrodden, but I'm I'm disappointed. 
Okay. Um, I'm disappointed in the lack of leadership in this country. I'm uh, starting at the uh, White House on down. I'm I'm disappointed in people who have just assumed that everything is fine, and they're not speaking up when they should be. Um, I just assumed there would be a, a protest going on every day with what is happening to regarding immigration, regarding um, women's rights, and especially voters' rights. Uh, I I'm just uh, you know it's almost it's it's like history repeating itself. All of these things that we have fought very hard for and have uh, gotten laws changed for the better, uh, yes. the betterment of our country for all people, are being questioned today and, and, and tried to, to be turned around and being uh, repealed and so forth. Um, that is, is disheartening because, as I said before, I have two grandchildren, and I, I was hoping that things, as, as they get older, that things would get better. We have a strong foundation here in this country, and I, we, someone is, and groups are, are trying to chisel uh, into this, this foundation and trying to uh, put cracks in it and, and split it up. And I, I just... Uh, that, that does bother me. Well, the foundation, in part, is as strong and as broad as it is because heroic ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls like you, uh, put yourself out there and put yourselves in harm's way to show us all a different way forward. It, it's it, remarkable. In 1999, I know you were recognized for that hero at yeah. the White House. Tell me what it's like for you to meet a president who hails from Little Rock, Arkansas, and mm-hmm. as he hands you the Congressional Gold Medal. That was probably the, the it is the most um, memorable moment for yeah. me, okay, to receive the Congressional Gold Medal. Now, understand that Congress, on both sides of the aisle, agreed to give us the Congressional Gold Medal, and President Clinton asked, that he have the opportunity yes. to give it to us in the White House instead of us receiving it on Capitol Hill. So uh, it's not the uh, some people get it confused and think it was yes. the Presidential Medal of Honor, but it's not. It is the Congressional Medal of Honor, which is the highest honor that can uh, any civilian can receive. So I'm I'm. I, I'm just overwhelmed with that. <laughs> Initially, I used to take it on my um, speaking engagement, yes. especially to when when it was young people, and so that they could see it and touch it and feel it. Uh, because I know I enjoyed uh, field trips and I things that I read in the books and magazines. I I once I saw it in 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 person. It just meant a lot to me, and I thought that that would be good for young people. However, with what takes place now to travel, going through um, <laughs> uh, the airports, um, it, it, it adds another 30 to 40 minutes on my yes. time, and I, I just don't do it anymore. I'm well, and the idea of it. leaving that on the overhead or uh, at some right. uh, Howard Johnson's down the street would, would break go. my heart, man. So I think <laughs> it ought to be safely yeah, in it's safe with It's safe with me. So anyway, it, 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 that is quite an honor. It really is. And we have received many honors uh, as a group, and, um, and, all of, and a number of us have received a, num- a, a number of individual awards. I've received probably five uh, honorary doctorates um, as well. Um, the Pierre Marquette Award, and another one was the Abraham Lincoln uh, Leadership um, award, which was uh, very meaningful to us as well. So it, you know, those sort of things. Did I expect that when I went to Central? No. <laughs> right. Okay. Um, but I, again, um, it 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 is quite an honor. It really is. Final question before we shift gears into the mm-hmm. the quick live inspired seven. For those of us who see things broken obviously broken in our marriages, in our, with our children, with our schools, churches, synagogues, businesses, society at large. We see things that are amiss, and we just feel broken down by, downtrodden, to use a previous word. What 
What bit of advice would you offer to those of us that see something that we want better, but we're not sure what to do about it? What would you well, say to us? Well, I, I would suggest, first of all, knowing who you are, and, and once you are centered, you, you do find answers um, to as to what is best for you to do. But I do think um, communications is very important, and uh, communicating with, with those that, it, it, it is making things difficult and trying to sit down and have a, a conversation where uh, people can come together and, and solve a problem, whatever that problem might be. So I, I really think it's about speaking up and in a non-confrontational way. Mm. Uh, I think that's very key. Uh, unfortunately, a lot of things just come out very negatively and, and confrontationally with some people. So yes. I, I would just suggest to try to do it in a calm, calm manner. Carlotta, Carlotta Lanier, what's the best book you've ever read? The best? <laughs> um, I, I was asked this question not too long ago. Uh, I, I have, um, that, that's, uh, outside of my own book, <laughs> which I always <laughs> like to say. Go ahead and plug yeah. it again. Tell, tell us the name of your book <laughs> one more time. A Mighty Long Way there you go. <laughs> in My Journey to Justice <laughs> at Little Rock Central High. Uh, I, You know, a number of books. I enjoy all, uh, a lot of biographies, so it, it's kind of difficult for me to say the best book. Um, uh, I enjoyed reading um, the biography on Thurgood Marshall, mm. uh, who was one of my heroes. Um, I, I've enjoyed a lot of uh, uh, Shirley MacLaine books. Uh, so, it, you know, it, it, and Maya Angelou is high on my list. Uh, the Warmth of Many, of, of Many Sons, I think it's Warmth of Many Sons by Isabel Wilkerson, is a great book for all Americans to understand about the Great Migration. Mm-hmm. <laughs> and, um, um, I, you know, it, it, they're all learning tools, and I, I just... Uh, so I, those are the kinds, kinds of books I like to read. Well, the next one on my list is a book called A Mighty Long Way Home. So Thank you. I, I'm looking forward to that. I really am. <laughs> All right. <laughs> Tomorrow, and these are part of the Live Inspired 7 Questions. Tomorrow, you discovered that your wealthy uncle has shockingly died at 103, leaving you, my friends, with millions. What would you do with that newfound wealth? Well, well uh, first of all, I'd make sure that my family was taken care of, and my grandchildren were uh, probably set up to go to college and that sort of thing. And um, they, the, in other words, family would come first. And then second, I would, uh, if it happened today, I would also want to see to it that uh, my fellow Americans in Puerto Rico had w- clean water to drink mm. um, uh, and, and, and and help them get away from San Juan or Puerto Rico until the the services were returned to that area. Um, I I would um, give to some universities, uh, give to some charities, uh, uh, especially the NAACP Legal Defense Fund. There are two organizations, but the Legal Defense Fund uh, really was one that supported us, where Thurgood Marshall was the lead um, lawyer there. So I would definitely give that. If your house caught fire and all living things, people and pets, are already out, and you have an opportunity to run in and grab a single item, just one thing, what would you run in and grab? My congressional gold medal. (laughs) (laughs) So I've never seen one. Describe it for me. It is extremely heavy. Um, it's not one that you put around you and did it. you know this this is a metal it is solid gold and uh it ours and and each one will have a different picture on it um uh, it it they had a committee to decide what would be on it and ours had uh, the the picture of the school and us uh going up the steps um mm. with the military and on the back it has the list of nine names Carlotta, do you have a picture of that? Yes, I do. Can you? Would you share that with us, and I'll, I'll put it online so our friends can see it. Okay, I will. Um, I'll. I'll. I'll do that. Uh, we. We would. I would love it, and I know okay. a lot of our listeners would love to see it sure. too. It's incredibly beautiful. Okay. If if you 
personally could sit on a bench overlooking a beach on a gorgeous day and have a long conversation with anybody, living or dead, who would you want to be hanging out on that park bench with? Well, <laughs> there's so many people. <laughs> Who would I individual? Okay, an individual that I would love to just sit there and talk to. You got all day. Yeah, and had all day to talk about it. Oh, I, I still think Thurgood Marshall would be one. Hmm. Uh, someone that uh, who who had to defend uh, so many yes. the masses. So. Yeah, uh, I, I either either Marshall or I have you know I've spoken with so many. Not that I've you know such as Clinton and President Clinton, President Obama, President Bush. I, I've had some great opportunities to talk with them. So um, any other person outside of of those sort of things, I don't know. Maybe my grandfather mm. again, who has passed on. Awesome. Mm -hmm. Well, I look forward to you having the day, not too soon, but no. having the opportunity to talk to Grandpa <laughs> again and Thurgood Marshall and others. Right. <laughs> Just a couple questions left. What would you tell your 20-year-old self? My 20-year-old self to uh, that you've got a lot of work to do ahead <laughs> and that, um, you know, stay true to yourself and, and uh, the, all of that you have learned you will be learning more mm -hmm. and, and to keep your mind open and your eyes open and, um, and, and stay um, in the moment. What's the best advice you've ever received? The best advice? Um, well, to be fair, and the best advice was really the golden rule. And I still say that. I, I grew up on that. Do unto others as you would have them to do unto you. What an important thing to remind ourselves when we're going through life, whether through the riots or through the coffee shop, to just simply do unto others the way you'd have them do unto you. Right. Well, the, that's what I would, <laughs> that, that's how I feel. Uh, I, would, I would keep that in mind, um, that, uh, to, to be fair with people. My final question to you, my friend, is it has been said that all great people— and there is no doubt today we are interviewing one, can have their lives summed up in one sentence. Carlotta Lanier, how would you want your one sentence to read? Oh, I would say that um, when I make a commitment, I, I see it to the end. <sighs> Carlotta Lanier, you made a commitment as a 14-year-old. You are still seeing it through to its end, and it has been an absolute joy six years after you originally made that commitment to be with you on the air today. Well, thank you very much, and I thoroughly enjoyed speaking with you too, John. My friends, that was Carlotta Lanier. This is John O'Leary, and today is your day. Live inspired. Well, my friends, I think history does indeed have a way of repeating itself, but luckily for us, if we have great examples like Carlotta and those around her and around us in life, we will be encouraged not to repeat the mistakes from yesterday, but to learn from them and to do work, to do relationships, to do community effort, to do, to do school, to do life even better afterwards. I think this is true across the board in communities, but it's also true in our life. Part of the reason for this podcast is to wake up from accidental living so that we can learn the lessons from our past and to do our life even better going forward to truly Live Inspired. We have the honor of bringing these guests into your living room, into your cars, into your earphones, into your lives. If it moves you to the same degree that it moves us to share these stories, do me a favor, share it online. Tell your friends on social media, Facebook, Twitter, in the back of wherever you may worship or work or drive, hang out, work out, what you're checking out. That, uh, yeah, the news has a lot of negativity, and yet there's this Live Inspired podcast where we talk about some of the challenges, but instead of living in the challenges, we talk about solutions. Solutions across the board, but solutions in our own backyard, including the reflection in the mirror. My friends, share the website, share the good news. They can learn more, and so can you at John O'Leary Inspires.com. 
Thank you for checking it out. Thank you for being part of our Live Inspired community, my friends, for this time. And until next time, this is John O'Leary, and today is your day. Live Inspired.